to raise the minimum wage to at least $11 an hour. Most of the 30 million low-wage workers, the majority of whom are women and minorities, struggle at a subsistence level playing one lender off another to survive. By raising their wages, we raise not only the quality of their lives, but we increase their personal and their political power. We break one of the critical shackles used by corporate forces to prevent organized resistance. Ralph, who I spoke with, as I said, on Thursday, has been calling for some time an activist to mobilize around raising the minimum wage. And Ralph knows more about corporate power and has been fighting it longer than any other American citizen. He has singled out, I believe, the key to building a broad-based national movement. There is, among these 30 million working poor, and some of them are probably with us tonight, amounting despair at being unable to meet the basic requirements to sustain a family. Nader points out that Walmart's one million workers, like most of the 30 million low-wage workers, are making less per hour, adjusted for inflation, than workers made in 1968. Although these same Walmart workers do the work required of two Walmart workers 40 years ago. Instead, although costs and prices have soared, the minimum wage remains stuck nationally at $7.25, the lowest of all the major industrial countries. Meanwhile, Mike Duke, the CEO of Walmart, makes $11,000 an hour, and he is not alone. These corporate chiefs make this much money because they have been able to keep in place a system by which workers are effectively disempowered, forced to work for substandard wages, and denied the possibility through unions or formal electoral systems of power to defend workers' rights. This is why corporations lavish these CEOs with obscene salaries. These CEOs are the masters of plantations. And the moment workers rise up and demand justice is the moment the staggering inequality of wealth begins to be reversed. Being a member Working poor, as Barbara Ehrenreich chronicles in her important book, Nickel and Dime, has become in this country one long emergency. It is a daily and weekly lurching from crisis to crisis. The stress, the fear, the suffering, the insecurity means workers are reduced often to doing little more than eating, sleeping, and never enough, and working. And they are kept in a constant state of fear. Aaron Wright writes, when someone works for less pay than she can live on, when, for example, she goes hungry so that you can eat more cheaply and conveniently, then she has made a great sacrifice for you. She has made you a gift of some part of her abilities, her health, and her life. The working poor, as they are approvingly termed, are in fact the major philanthropists of our society. They neglect their own children so that the children of others will be cared for. They live substandard housing so that other homes will be shiny and perfect. They endure privation 
so that inflation will be low and stock prices high. To be a member of the working poor is to be an anonymous donor, a nameless benefactor to everyone else. It is time to hold this sacrifice of our working poor. It is time to empower the 30 million low-wage workers in this country, two-thirds of whom are employed by large corporations like Walmart and McDonald's to fight back. The cartoonist Joe Sacco and I spent the last two years in the poorest pockets of the United States, our nation's sacrifice zones for our book, Days of Destruction, Days of Rule. We saw in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, Camden, New Jersey, the poorest and most dangerous city in the nation, the coal fields of southern West Virginia, and the produce fields of Lockerbie Ford, how this brutal system of corporate exploitation works. In these sacrifice zones, no one has legal protection. All institutions, from the press, to the political class, to the judiciary, are wholly owned subsidiaries of the corporate state. And what has been done to the people in these sacrifice zones, places that were devastated first, is now being done to the rest of us. There are no impediments left within the electoral process or the formal structures of power to hold predatory corporate capitalism. We are all being forced to kneel before the dictates of the marketplace. And the despair, the hopelessness, the attendant problems of drug and alcohol abuse, the neglect of children, the early deaths, in Pine Ridge, the average life expectancy for a male is 48, that is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of me, is justified by the need to make greater and greater profit. All of this is being played out across the nation, making the phrase the consent of the government a cruel joke. We continue to use a language to describe our nation and our systems of governance that no longer correspond to reality, making us perhaps the most self-deluded population on the planet. This binarization of the American working class and increasingly the middle class is by design. It is part of corporate reconfiguration the national economy and the global economy into a form of neo-feudalism. It is about creating a world of masters and serfs, of an empowered oligarchic elite and broken, disempowered masses. And it is not only our wealth that is taken from us, but our liberty. The so-called self-regulating market, as the economist Carl Pugliani wrote in The Great Transformation, always ends with a mafia capitalism and a mafia political system. Such a system, Pugliani wrote, leads always to the demolition of society. And that is what is happening. The demolition of our society and the demolition of the ecosystem that sustains the human species. In theological terms, these corporate forces, driven by a constant quest for ceaseless exploitation and an increase in profits, are systems of death. They know no limits. They will not stop on their own. And unless we stop them, we as a nation and finally as a species are doomed. Polyani understood the deeply destructive power of unrestrained corporate capitalism 
In his book he wrote, in disposing of a man's labor power, the system would incidentally dispose of the physical, psychological, and moral entity, man, attached to the tag. Robbed of the protective covering of cultural institutions, human beings would perish from the effects of social exposure. They would die as victims of acute social dislocation through vice, perversion, crime, and starvation. Nature would be reduced to its elements, neighborhoods and landscapes defiled, rivers polluted, military safety jeopardized, the power to produce food and raw materials destroyed. Finally, the market administration of purchasing power would periodically liquidate business enterprise for shortages and surfeits of money would prove disastrous to business as floods and droughts in primitive society. Undoubtedly, labor, land, and money markets are essential to a market economy, but no society could stand the effects of such a system of crude fictions even for the shortest stretch of time, unless its human and natural substance, as well as its business organizations, was protected against the ravages of this satanic mill. The global and national economy continues to deteriorate, and yet, curiously, stock market price levels are close to their highs in 2007, on the eve of the meltdown. This is because these corporations have been able to suppress wages, slash social programs, and build the government for staggering sums of money. The Federal Reserve purchases about $85 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities and treasury bills every month. This means that the Fed is printing endless streams of money to buy up government debt and toxic assets from banks. The Federal Reserve now owns assets, much of them worthless, of $3.01 trillion. That is triple what it was in 2000. And while corporations such as Citibank or General Electric loot the Treasury, they exact more pounds of flesh from workers in the name of austerity. General Electric, as Ralph points out, is a net job exporter. Over the past decade, the Citizens for Tax Justice has documented General Electric's effective federal income tax rate on its $81.2 billion in pre-tax U.S. profits has been, at most, 1.8%. Because of the way General Electric's accountants play with tax liabilities, the company actually receives money from the Treasury. They have several billion dollars paid to them from the federal government into company bank accounts, and these are not tax refunds. The company, as Nader argues, is a net drain on the Treasury, as well as a net drain on jobs. It violates a host of environmental and criminal laws. And yet, Jeffrey Emmett, the CEO of General Electric, was appointed to be the chairman of President Obama's Job Council. Immelt's only contribution to the jobs initiative was to close plants this week in Warren, Ohio, and Ravine, Ohio, along with six turbine repair facilities in cities such as Pittsburgh and Houston. Kenneth Chenault, the chairman and chief executive of American Express Company, shortly before the president appointed him to the council, cut 550 jobs for 1% of his workforce. And this, as American Express reported a profit of $1.1 billion in the fourth quarter of 2010, a 48% increase over the previous year. Jim McNerney, the 
president and CEO of Boeing, who also sat on the Jobs Council, has cut 30% of its management positions and closed plants in California. Boeing announced it will additionally cut 40% of its workforce at a plant in El Paso, Texas. The only jobs the Job Council was concerned with were the ones these CEOs eradicated. And this council is a microcosm of what is happening within the corridors of power, where corporations, in essence, are stealing as much, as fast as they can, on the way out the door. As Michael Hudson has pointed out, financialization has created a new form of class warfare. The old class warfare took place between workers and bosses. Workers organized to fight for better wages, fairer work hours, safety conditions in the workplace, as well as adequate pensions and medical benefits. But with a country of debtors and a government that must also borrow to continue operating, Hudson says we have changed the way class warfare works. Finance, he points out, controls state and federal policy. It therefore dictates working conditions. The financiers who provide the loans to government demand austerity and long-term unemployment to, as Hudson told a Greek newspaper, drive down wages to a degree that could not occur in the company-by-company -company clash between industrial employers and their workers. Now, the former Federal Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan, testifying before Congress, pointed out that since 1980, productivity, worker productivity, has increased by 83%. But real wages have declined. Greenspan said this was because workers were too burdened with mortgage debts, college loans, auto loans, and credit card debt to risk losing a job. Household debt in the United States is now around $13 trillion. That's only $2 trillion less than the country's total yearly economic outcome. Greenspan is right. Miss a payment on your credit card, and your interest rate drops to 30%. Fail to pay your mortgage, and you lose your home. Miss your health insurance payments, which are spiraling upwards. And if you are seriously ill, you go into bankruptcy as one million Americans who get sick do every year, and 80% of those people had health insurance. Trash your credit rating, and your fragile financial edifice built on managing debt collapses. Since every American feels on some level that they are a step or two away from being homeless, they are deeply adverse to fighting corporate power. It's not worth the risk, and the corporate state knows it. Absolute power, philosopher Thomas Hobbes wrote, depends not only on fear, but also on passivity. The only way to break this passivity and begin to empower workers is to break the cycle of mounting debt. And the first step to achieving independence from debt the primary form of political control used by the corporate state is to raise the minimum wage to give workers control over their own lives. There are other solutions for giving mortgage and student debt, universal health care, establishing a nationwide jobs program to rebuild the country's third world infrastructure and green energy. But none of this will happen until we are able to build a sustained mass movement that discredits and challenges the corporate state. And the mass movement will come, Nader argues, when we mobilize around the minimum wage. Of the some 30 million working poor, two-thirds work for these huge corporations, the ones who make staggering profits and pay their CEOs an average of $10 million a year. Most of these workers are minorities, and a disproportionate number of them are women. They have children to feed, rents to pay, 
medical bills to take care of, and they are not making it. The lowest grade worker at the General Electric plant that makes high-tech healthcare devices outside Patterson, New Jersey, in Totoa, a pay grade known as D04, was just raised recently to $14,555 a year. That's under $8 an hour. The highest paid hourly employee at the plant, known as D16, earns $22,000 a year. Emma makes over $11 million a year. And this abuse is played out in every corporation across the country, and no one in Washington intends to change it. Only 11.3% of workers in this country now will be unions. That is the lowest percentage in 80 years. And most of these unions, and in particular the AFL-CIO, have been emasculated by corporate power. Nader is right when he warns that we are not going to be assisted in this effort by established unions. Most union leaders have been bought off. They're comfortable. They're pulling in five times what their rank and file gets. And as Nader says, we must mount protests, not only outside of the borders of Walmart, General Electric, but outside congressional offices, and finally, the AFL-CIO itself. There is no established inside of the institution, inside or outside government, now that is on our side. They are broken or complicit. But there are 30 million working poor who, if we organize to break the system of debt payment that holds them hostage, may be willing to join us. We are bound with many chains and shackles. We will have to break them one at a time. But once we rise up, once we are able to threaten the corporate systems that keep us fearful and passive, we will unleash the torrent of energy and passion that will confirm the worst nightmares of our corporate overlords. Thank you. everything you've been doing with NDAA, first of all, uh, that takes a huge amount of courage. And my question is about how we can harmonize the effort of obsoleting corporations as well as for fighting for workers' rights. Because I fear, actually, that the corporate ruling class really just wants resistance as opposed to in innovation. And in a time where we can create our own internet mesh networks with our phones, can create our own currencies, how do we harmonize and actually educate the working class about the fact that they're in power of their means of production as well as their means right, of currency? That's a really good question. I think that, yes, he's asking um, how uh, we can empower the working class to create alternative systems, and I'll tell you if I frame this correctly, such as alternative currencies and this kind of stuff, to sever themselves from the control of the corporate Right, to obsolete the corporate state. To obsolete the corporate state. I think that... Um, In tandem with what you were saying. Right. I think that movements always progress by steps. Yeah. And the first step is to recognize this very nefarious form of control that the corporate state has quite consciously imposed on the working poor. And not just on the working poor, but on the middle class as well. You have people, you know, driving or spending time on a train, you know, an hour and a half each day, going into office buildings, never knowing if they're going to be outsourced or not. And they want that instability, they want that kind of fear. Uh, and I think that, um, I mean, you know, I have, like most people who, uh, 
read on these issues, problem with the whole concept of a wage economy and everything else. But I think we have to begin where people are. And uh, I think right now we have to be very sensitive and cognizant of the degree of suffering, which is tremendous now, visited upon the working poor. And we have to look at the first lever we can pull to begin to alleviate that suffering. And I think that revolves around the minimum wage. And other stuff will follow. Um, but having just spent two years in places where people are just not getting by, you see the pressure that uh, and the and, and the and the, um, the fear that essentially paralyzes them. I mean, they literally. I mean, Barbara gets it in the book. I mean, it is just week to week. You never, you're not quite sure if next week you're going to be sleeping in your car or not. And and that's why I think that the raising of the minimum wage is not about simply raising the quality of life, but about reinvesting these people with a kind of political power that I hope we can. Thank you so much for everything you shared. Um, I was wondering if you could speak specifically to the connections between what you're talking about and the corporate state, in terms of the corporate state and the assault on workers, uh, and the assault on workers, um, and what we're talking about a lot today, with, which is the recovery and the rebuilding effort with Sandy and how corporate interests are playing into that and how you think workers, um, sort of the worker struggle can sort of either leverage that or is, is uh, affected by it, you know, um, in terms of its inability, it's an, an additional squeeze on workers in terms of corporate attacks. So I'm just curious if you could speak to just the relationship between the rebuilding effort, disaster capitalism, and well, the assault on workers. Well, everything is tied up in climate change. Because, I mean, Pugliani, and this is, it's a really a, a book worth getting, The Great Transformation, written in 1944, which is a study of unfettered capitalism which, as Karl Marx correctly pointed out, is a revolutionary force. Everything's tied up in climate change because the, these corporate forces have commodified everything. Human beings are now commodities, and the natural world is a commodity that they will exploit until exhaustion or collapse. 40% um, of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, and for Shell Oil, this is a business opportunity. The death of the rose of the planet. And you go back and you read anthropologists like Tainter in the collapse of complex societies, or Redmond, uh, or Ronald Wright, Short History of Progress, and we have just fit the pattern of all collapsing civilizations. The difference is that when we go down now, the whole planet's going with us, the human species going with us. And by not responding rationally, to climate change. It means the next hurricane season that rolls around, or the one after that, is going to hit us maybe not with a category one, but a category two. Um, and wait until um, the New Jersey shore, or Rockaway, uh, or any of these other coastal communities get hit again. There finally will be an inability to rebuild that infrastructure. And we, we the estimates, I think, are $70 billion loss on this one. Uh, and so what we're watching is not only the breakdown of globalization, but the breakdown of the ecosystem. And the forces that are breaking them down are the same. And it's this neo-fuel global enterprise, uh, which is, and, and it, you know, they're very good. I mean, in terms of sort of fooling us, it, it is a multi-ethnic elite. I mean, for me, Obama is a brand. It functions as a brand for the corporate state. In the same way that a few years ago, Calvin Klein and Bennington would use HIV-positive models of people of color to identify their brand with sort of progressive politics and even a risky lifestyle. But the engines of the corporate state remain untouched. Um, so, Everything is interconnected. And to uh, somehow focus exclusively, and I mean, this for me is the beauty of the Occupy movement because it brings all these strands together, but to focus solely on re empowering workers and ignore 
the assault on the ecosystem means that everything you're doing for those workers in the end is nullified. I was on Democracy Now! a few weeks ago with Paul Krugman, and Krugman, you know, I, I like Paul, but his, his, he's essentially trying to rebuild a consumer economy that I think, number one, we can rebuild, and number two, it will kill us if we try and rebuild it. And I said to him, you know, he's, he's constantly calling on the government to respond rationally to the economics crisis, which is a jobs program. I mean, of course, I agree. A moratorium on foreclosures of bank. This is all rational. And I said, Paul, what if you're appealing to a corporate system that is incapable of responding rationally? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially an analysis of power. I don't share this analysis of power. I don't think that the corporate system is capable of responding rationally. And Krugman's answer to me was, it doesn't matter climate change, we'll finish this thing. What a douche. Hey, but he's, he's probably right. I mean, the, 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 the willful denial of what's happening in front of us. I mean, when, when, when civilizations die, their cities go first. Travel around this country. And not just Camden, we did Camden in the book because it's the worst example, it's the poorest city in the country, but, you know, Detroit, Cleveland, you know, Trenton, it's everywhere. So, um, I think somehow, you know, the, since our corporate systems of information are controlled by roughly a half dozen companies, Viacom, General Electric, Uber, Burbank, News Corp, Disney, Clear Channel, they blocked out the rational debate. And the rational debate happens on the fringes of society. It happened in Zuccotti Park. Um, and I, you know, I think that we're, for that reason we're in a very, very dangerous time because once the infrastructure starts to collapse, fear and insecurity increases. And the one appeal of what Sheldon Wong calls our system of converted totalitarianism is that let us take away all your rights and we can protect you. And that's what the, I mean, the fact that, I don't know how, if you're following the, this lawsuit that I um, brought against the President and the Defense Secretary a year ago over the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, this is uh, a section which permits the U.S. military to carry out domestic policing. It overturns 200 years of domestic law. They can seize American citizens who are, it's really pernicious language, who are charged with substantially supporting, now that's not a legal term, material support is a legal term, substantially supporting, that's a nebulous term, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or something called associated forces, again not defined. Holding those people in military internment camps, or military prisons, denying them due process indefinitely. Now, it was a quixotic quest, and we happened to get a courageous judge, Catherine Forrest, in the Southern District Court of New York, who had now declared that section unconstitutional. The Obama administration didn't just appeal, we knew they'd appeal. They went to Judge Forrest on the day of the ruling. Suddenly the lawyers changed, by the way. Instead of having government uh, uh, federal attorneys, we got Pentagon lawyers. And they went to the judge and they said, you have to immediately, in the name of national security, issue a stay, which means you have to put the law back into effect until we appeal. She refused to regret it. So then they went to the Second Circuit, the appellate court, where I'm going to be on Wednesday. And they said, we, at 9 a.m., it was Yom Kippur, 9 a.m., this was a Friday afternoon, they demanded an emergency hearing, which they got at 9 a.m. Monday morning. And they said, we need an emergency stay in the name of national security until you hear it. And the appellate court gave it to them to put the law back into effect. Now, why? Why did they act so aggressively? There can only be one reason, and that's because they're already used to it. Probably, my guess, is it against uh, U.S.-Pakistani dual nationals in places like Iraq. Because if those people, American citizens, were being held in military facilities without due process, 
and that injunction was allowed to stand, they would be in contempt of court. All of these laws are being put through by design. They know what's coming down. The national security has run endless models of civic unrest because of climate change, economic meltdown. They know what's coming internally within power. And they are creating legal mechanisms by which dissent becomes impossible. And the NDAA, I think, was ran through with bipartisan effort because they don't finally trust the police to protect them. Uh, and, and you know, you study the history of any totalitarian state. I mean, Sebastian Hoffner, in his great sort of chronicle uh, called Define Hitler, was a lawyer in the law courts, 1933, when the Nazis come to power. And so he watches that the first thing they do is corrupt the legal system. Essentially, they make criminality legal. And um, every totalitarian state does that. And so for, I've lived in a few, and um, I mean, you know, it's by design, and it's terrifying. Um, I mean, if the NDA, Judge Forrest's 112 page opinion, which is really a remarkable document, she talks about this law essentially resurrecting what happened to 110,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. That essentially it allows you to categorize an entire type of people. They're never charged with a crime, they have no access to a lawyer, um, can be placed in military camps. That's what it is. So, um, I really didn't answer your question, but <laughs> the, the, I think it's all in her, I think that, you know, the, the, for, for me, the power of the Occupy movement is that it got, it got the fact that it all stems from corporate power. I mean, I used to sort of listen to people say, the mainstream, which I used to be a part of, um, go, well, what are their demands? What are their demands? Well, I, I thought the demands were really clear. We want to reverse the corporate coup d'etat that took place and restore power to the citizen. Well, do they want campaign finance? Well, yeah, of course we want campaign finance. Who the hell is going to vote for campaign finance? Do we want a rational health care program? Yes, of course. Um, you know, Crane Brinton writes a great book, Anatomy of the Revolution, which I just reread. Um, and he studies the French, the British, and the American Revolution. And he tries to you know, like uh, uh, anthropologists like Tainter, he tries to get the patterns. You know, what happens when a society breaks down? And one of the, it, read it, because they're all, we fulfill every single requirement. And one of them is that you begin to build a popular movement that makes the demand that the power elite cannot hear because it would mean their dissolution. And that's precisely what Occupy did. So when they were saying, what are your demands? It's because the elite couldn't hear that the demand was their abolition, which is the only thing that's going to save us. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it, it, I'll let you pick. You can. Yeah, in, your, in your uh, talk and in your book, you've uh, focused on Camden, New Jersey, uh, and the other poverty there to underscore your call, your demand uh, to raise the minimum wage to $11. But if we look at uh, the northern part of the state, uh, in a city nearly as poor uh, as, uh, as Camden, Newark, New Jersey, they weren't uh, the, the popular movements there, like the People's Organization for Progress, a number of groups, weren't settling for a measly uh, raise to $11 an hour, but instead were calling for a direct mass, direct government employment, not contracting. At union wages, not yearly poverty, but wages of eleven dollars an hour for a democratically controlled mass public works program to rebuild uh, New Newark, Camden, New York, New Orleans, and the country and the world, for that matter, paid by taxing the rich uh, and ending the wars, the U.S. military machine, and that's been a demand that's been gaining traction. When Katrina survived, that was one of the demands coming out, demand on the state, stop privatization, but we also went to New Orleans as a disaster well before Katrina, and we needed a mass public works program. It emerged in the Occupy movement. That was the man, I was a part of that movement. 60% voted for it, but underneath the anti-democratic rules of 90% that even the U.S. Senate doesn't operate under, it couldn't get passed. 
So I think Sandy, as well, has further underscored the need for a mass public works program. And I think that's the type of demand that the, the call for $11 an hour, that, is one, doesn't meet the needs of people. But furthermore, it doesn't speak to the broad, it's really working for, but the working class that has the real power to force that can still fear in this ruling class. Right. Let me just finish up. That has correctly, correctly characterized as vicious and ruthless and will not back off unless their power might be, they fear their power might be taken away. So I, I think you mentioned the public work, but I think that's something that could really galvanize a broad section of the work that me as a public sector work, privileged worker, a community who's under the gun. Or it's that now where, where, where middle income homeowners have been wiped away and really need the mass public works program to protect. Well, but this is the kind of argument I have with Cooper. You can appeal to centers of power that have no intention of responding. It's like writing a letter to Uncle Joe Stop. If they, only, if they only knew what they were doing. And, and I'm all for it. I mean, you know, Krugman writes this, you know, and I agree. We need a massive program of public works at union wages. That's the last thing the corporate old lackeys in the Congress are ever going to get us. And, and so we have to organize around, I think, something much more basic. I agree, $11 is, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not in charge of the campaign. You know, maybe 20 is the answer. But I, I think that, again, appealing to those systems of power, and, and I would cite uh, Sheldon Wolin's brilliant sort of dissection of power in his book, Democracy Incorporated, without question our greatest living political philosopher. Uh, you know, he says we live in a system of inverted totalitarianism. By that, he means it's not conventional totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. That in classical totalitarian regimes, you have a reactionary or revolutionary force that overturns and decaying, takes over a decaying structure. In inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the iconography and language of American patriotism and the Constitution, and yet internally, they write all the legislation, have corrupted all of the systems of powers and render the citizen impotent. So I'm with you, except that that, again, my argument, and I think, again, this is a broad sentiment in the Occupy movement, which I tend to agree with, I don't want to see us funnel energy into a dead political system. Uh, because it is dead. These people are so cynical, so corrupt, so bought off. I mean, I went through day by day that healthcare day with Max Bogus. I mean, this was uh, Fowler, who was, uh, you know, making millions working for, I guess, at WellPoint. She wrote the damn Obamacare. Now she just went back into the industry. I mean, it's just such a scam. And uh, I, I think that what you say is, is great, but I, I think that's probably the next step. I think the first step, I, I, and I go back to Aaron, I mean, I think is, is confronting the emergency that the working poor are in and responding with something that is easily graspable, that cuts across political lines. You go to a Walmart in Charlotte, anywhere, it doesn't matter who they vote for, whether they're Tea Party, and tell them you want to fight for raising minimum wage for eleven dollars an hour, would you? So I, I fully agree with you. It's a question of this of understanding the systems of power and whether they can be appealed to. And I don't believe they can. I'll let the guy with the mic. He's in charge of picking. First of all, thanks for coming to speak today. Um, with
whole dynamic of ceaseless <laughs> exploitation and uh, you know, limitless capitalist expansion is the very force that will bring us down. And this, you know, if, you know Tainter and Redmond uh, and Wright, and all anthropologists cite exactly those forces as destroying, you know, whether it's the Mayans or Sumer or anywhere else. I mean, Tainter studies 24 different civilizations. So we live in a kind of transitional period by which all of the accepted uh, uh, ideologies uh, and, and the language we use to describe who we are are our, our hollow, meaningless. And I think part of the opportunity is discovering a new language to begin to describe how we are form human communities. No, I mean, when I said these systems in theological terms were literally systems of death and men, they will kill us if we don't break them. They will, I have four children. My little one, his favorite book is called Out of the Blue. It's pictures of narwhals and purple. And every time I see him go through that book, it breaks my heart. Because I say, if I know that if there is not a radical change in human behavior, every one of those sea creatures will be dead within his lifetime. That's the world we're headed for. No, we can't tweak the system. We have to destroy it. It's what Harrison said to a bunch of anarchists. Uh, you know, you, you, you think we're the doctor. Uh, we're not the doctor, we're the disease. Thank you for coming to me. One of your recent articles, you say that the acceptance of this increasingly, seems increasingly like the potential for a societal collapse, which is a global society, the acceptance of that would be the greatest moral challenge of the century. And so I'm wondering what you think it looks like when individuals and communities address that on a social, emotional, emotional, and political level as we can organize democratically, community based. What is a you know, what is that moral response look like and how do we how do we start creating it? Well, Father Daniel Berryman, who I just saw a few weeks ago, he was 93, he was a great hero of mine. Um, I mean, I, I retreat into my training as a center and you're here, you know, he says we're called to do the good or at least the good insofar as we can determine it, and then we have to let it go. The Buddhists call it karma. Faith is the belief that it goes somewhere, that the good attracts to it the good. But if we get caught up in the traditional highs and lows of modern American life, we're going to fall into despair. It may be that at the end of my lifetime, or perhaps at the end of your lifetime, uh, all of the empirical evidence around us shows us that things are worse. That does not invalidate the life of resistance. I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe for the New York Times. Uh, no, I was before the New York Times, but I covered them for the Dallas one. And so I was in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania. And I saw the power of resistance, which had been going on in Eastern Europe for years, a totally marginalized, um, you know, the, the street protests that brought down the communist government in East Germany were begun in Leipzig by Lutheran clerics. They hold lonely candlelit vigils once a week. Nobody would come, and then suddenly 70,000 people came. And the response to the state, and this is why I've been so fervent about making sure that we remain in a nonviolent movement, was to send down the elite paratroop division and fire on the demonstrators. The elite paratroop division got to the Leipzig and they couldn't do it. And then Conacher, the dictator, had been in power for 19 years, lasted another week. I was in Czechoslovakia, I spent every night in the Magic Manor Theater with Moscow Hall and Klaus and Binsbier and all the people who had ended up inheriting the government. And that winter, up and down the streets of Prague were posters of Jan Pollock. He was a young Charles University student who, to protest the Soviet invasion that overturned uh, Dubček in the Prague Spring, uh, burned himself, lit himself on fire. He died four days later of his burns. Thousands of students tried to carry his body to the cemetery. They were broken up by the police. None of it was covered in the state. 
His, his grave became a shrine. The state dug up his remains, uh, cremated them, gave the ashes to his mother, said she was not forbidden to bury them. Um, two weeks after the communist government fell, 10,000 people gathered in Red Army Square and renamed it Yan Pong Square. I was in Vetsala Square uh, that winter when a singer named Marta Kuroshova, who had been the most famous singer in Yugoslavia before 68, walked out on her balcony and she had sung an anthem of defiance that was broadcast over the airwaves when the Soviets invaded. And once the pro-Soviet regime was put back in power, her entire recording stock was destroyed. She was forbidden from ever appearing on the airwaves, and she had spent the intervening years working on an assembly line in Joy Factory. She walked out of that balcony and sang that anthem in every check in that crowd. There were 500,000 of them everywhere. That is the power of what Vasil Havel in his great 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, calls living in truth. And I think we are at that. This corporate power is far more fragile than it appears. Remember, I covered the Stasi state in East Germany, and for every 63 East Germans there was an informant. It was the most sophisticated security and surveillance state until this one. And that's, we can't beat them at their own game. We can't. We need utter transparency. We need nonviolence and we need to live in truth. And Havel gets it. Uh, and I think they're so decayed, so discredited, while they appear powerful. And I think that's why the NDA is run through. I mean, you know, you, many of you were in Zuccotti, you know how the blue uniform police would fraternize and the white shirts would show up, everything would change. I gave a talk a few months ago at a church in New York, and on a YouTube clip, I had was given a talk, apparently in Zakati, and I said, look, don't be too hard on these blue uniform cops. They have to live with these white shirted assholes all day long. We only have to see them in an hour or two. And after the talk, a guy comes up to me. He said, I read all your books on a white shirted asshole. And it was a really important lesson for me, not even to demonize the power. What we are seeking to do by living in truth is paralyze them through the civil service, through the police, through the all those people internally who know it's wrong. So that when the moment of confrontation comes, and it will come, they're not able to respond. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, certainly what I witnessed in Eastern Europe, and, and I, it's possible, but we have to build a sustained mass movement. We have to do it around an issue that is easily grasped by, let's face it, a large section of this population that has been kept in darkness and is politically very naive. You can get information in the age of the internet, but only if you're proactive. And most people are not proactive in terms of their information. 90% um, of what Americans watch or listen to is controlled by these corporations. I mean, look, even MSNBC, which I detest, because it's just court gossip spun from a different angle, utterly ignored the NDAA. Uh, because they are a propaganda wing for the Democratic Party and Barack Obama. Interestingly, the only journalistic outlet that seriously covered the NDAA in the case was the New York Times, which I worked for for 15 years. While certainly an elitist publication, at least still does journalism. Not only did they cover the case, they wrote an editorial supporting Judge Moore's decision. There was never a mention of it on any show on MSNBC, not one, and not on Fox, all these strict constitutionalists. You know, it, and that for me was a kind of window. You know, it, it's what Dorothy Parker once said about Catherine Hepburn's emotional range as an actress who goes from A to B. That's where political dialogue is kept, within that narrow, those narrow parameters, you step outside them, like Rick Nader, and you become a pariah.
The question is how do you make the power elite frightened of you? And that's through movements. Our movements in this country were destroyed, courtesy of Woodrow Wilson, uh, in the name of anti-communism, and now in the name of terror. It doesn't matter, you know, the language, it's all the same. Uh, there's a wonderful moment in Kissinger's memoirs, do not buy the book, where it's 1971, and Kissinger and Nixon, according to Kissinger, are standing in a window, and there's a huge anti-war demonstration. And Nixon has surrounded the White House with empty buses as a barricade. And he's wringing his hands going, Henry, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that's just where we want people in power to be. Nixon was our last liberal president. Not because he was a liberal, but because he was scared of movements. And we have to rebuild those movements and accept that we are going to hold fast to these moral principles and never achieve power. The liberal class, Chomsky has nailed it. Um, I spent a lot of time in my book, Death of the Liberal Class, talking about it. Is a safety valve. It was never designed to be the political left. When Conrad Black writes his biography of Roosevelt, he says that Roosevelt's greatest achievement was that he saved capitalism. That's right. Roosevelt was a conciliatory figure who all of the New Deal, the best of the New Deal, came out of the left. It came out of the Communist Party, which has been utterly whitewashed from our history. It came out of the Wobblies. It came out of the Progressive Party. It came out of Eugene Debs and the Socialist Party. And at a moment when we most need these popular movements, we don't have them. So uh, I, I share your despair with what happened in Eastern Europe. I'm only talking about the process of revolution. Um, and I suppose the difference is where they were fighting a decayed and corrupt totalitarian communist system, you know, unchecked, centralized power is totalitarian. It doesn't matter whether it's fascist, communist, or corporate. And we are challenging totalitarian capitalism. Um, and, uh, I mean, one of the things is, you know, I would be frank with the seven-hour general assembly drove me insane, and yet, there was such a respect for trying to give everyone a voice and trying to create a decision by consensus, although I wanted to give every member of Occupy Kropotkin who said you can't do it, uh, over 150 people. Um, that that, that top-down, uh, demagogic, traditional hierarchical, I mean, you know, Martin Luther once said, our greatest sin is our greatest strength. And I think that while the decision-making process got cumbersome and messy, once the decision was made, it was a and so I don't worry about, I mean, one of the things I like about the Occupy movement is that it didn't have those totalitarian tendencies. It didn't raise a particular figure. And I tried, because I did a lot of media, I tried to not only be respectful of that, but I never spoke about we, I always spoke about them. Because I never wanted to be interpreted as a spokesperson in any way. So the, the fear of, you know, reverting to another totalitarianism, at least among the left, Yahweh is not there. I'll just close by saying, for me, the danger comes from powerful proto-fascist movements within this country, the body, and the Christian body. The Tea Party, militias, and the lunatic fringe of the Republican. These people are terrified, and they function as fascist movements. They speak in the language of violence, they celebrate the gun culture, and let's be clear why we will never have gun control in this country, and that's because these white nativists are scared of our people. Yeah, that's it. Seriously. That's why they want those guns. In the same way, why did we have the Second Amendment? It was for the slave patrols. It's because the states wanted to arm militias to keep African Americans in subjugation. It's a long part of a long continuum. And these movements 
do what fascist movements do, which is direct a legitimate rage, a legitimate sense of betrayal towards the vulnerable. Muslims, African Americans, undocumented workers, homosexuals, liberals, intellectuals, feminists, they've got a long list of people they hate. And I watched those movements rise up in Yugoslavia, created from economic dysfunction and despair. And they are bankrolled, as they already are, by the most retrograde elements of American capitalism, the Koch brothers and others. What we are living under, in essence, is a system of political paralysis. It doesn't, the government doesn't function. It cannot respond rationally. The longer that paralysis continues, and I watched it in Yugoslavia, which I covered for the New York Times, the more you empower extremes. Um, unfortunately, those of us who care about an open society have been so assaulted over the last century um, that we have to rebuild everything from scratch. Um, but don't underestimate the danger of those forces because as the society breaks down, those forces will become the kind of surrogate that are used by the corporate state to carry out violence. And boy, you know, I've done it, covered it in war after war after war. You first get people to speak in the language of violence, and then they carry out this violence. So I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened about what's happening. I'm frightened about what we're doing. I invested as much time as I did in the Occupy movement because I believe it's our last best hope to save what is left of our very anemic democracy. And people should. Can you stop? Thank you. Oh, he asked me about the court date on Wednesday, um, and uh, people are showing up. I mean, it's at, it's in Foley Square, 15th floor, uh, room 1505. It's a small courtroom. Um, uh, they've asked for a larger courtroom. They've asked for more. You know, for me, fighting the NDAA is really about protecting Occupy because there's no question, um, probably the first people that are round up are Black Rock. I've had my differences with them, but they'll be the first people that are round up, and the next will be Occupy activists. That's why this law is being created. Um, and I, I can't, you know, I don't have any idea what's going to happen, but the, the case will be heard at 10 o'clock. Okay. Well, so there will be outside Great. of the court as long as whatever is going on inside.